Hello and greetings from uh, Hyde Park. My name is Chris Weed. I'm executive director of the Stiegler Center for the study of the economy and the state at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, and we're so glad to have you here today. You know, the last year has seen considerable shifts in governing coalitions across Latin America uh, with significant ramifications for democracy and economic growth, both in the region and around the world. And today we're happy to be hosting a conversation on these developments and more with journalists, uh, Gabriel Baldoki, Daniel Matamala and Stephanie Tondo, moderated by Chicago Booth's own Hal Weitzman. Uh, Gabriel, Daniel, and Stephanie are all alumni of the Steelers Center Journalists in Residence Program, uh, an elite group of reporters uh, from worldwide publications who spend time uh, with us here at the University of Chicago. Uh, before we begin, please note that we are on the record. Uh, we will post this uh, video later to our YouTube channel. You can submit questions via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens, and we'll try as best we can to get it to as many of them as we can. And as usual, the views expressed by our guests are their own views, not those of the Stickler Center or the University of Chicago. I do wanna highlight uh, an upcoming mini course that the center is hosting by Paul Tucker, uh, central banker and regulator, uh, a former central banker and regulator at the Bank of England uh, on his newest book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a fracture, Fractured World Order. We're doing that in a couple of weeks, November 28th and 29th, both online and in person here at the university. You can check out our website for more details, uh, as well as our digital publication, ProMarket, and subscribe to our Capitalism podcast. The relevant links can be seen in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And now allow me to briefly introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, Gabrielle Baldoki is an editor for uh, uh, Ehenica, uh, excuse me, uh, Ehenica, uh Estado. He has been working as a financial journalist for 10 years for, for the main national newspapers and magazines in Brazil. He was a Stiegler Journalism Fellow in 2021. Daniel Matamala is an anchor uh, for Chile Vision and an op-ed contributor at La Chacera, among others, uh, among other publications. He is also the author of several books on politics in Chile. Daniel was a member of the 2018 Fellowship Cohort. Uh, and finally, Stephanie Tondo is a Brazilian journalist with experience as a financial and economics reporter in major newspapers in Rio, including uh, O Globo. Stephanie was a part of our most recent program in 2022. And moderating today will be Hal Weitzman. Hal is an adjunct associate professor of behavioral science, science executive director for intellectual capital at Chicago Booth, and editor-in-chief of the Chicago Booth Review. He was previously a journalist covering South America for the Financial Times. Uh, he's the author of two books. His most recent, What's the Matter with Delaware, was released earlier this year. Uh, Hal may be the only person alive who has written a book uh, on Delaware and separately on, on Latin America. And now, without further ado, uh, Hal, let me turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, yeah, I wrote a book a while ago about South America, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to brush up my uh, knowledge. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair to say that outside of Latin American ists, most people don't think very much of Latin America and the global north. It's not, um, it's not a topic of popular discussion. Um, I uh, thought very warmly of this discussion on Friday because my um, home country of Wales beat Argentina uh, in a big rugby game, which they could have lost, which Argentina, of course, beat England the week before. Uh, and yesterday, Joe Biden, uh, US president, confused Cambodia and Colombia, which, uh, which reminds me of the story about Ronald Reagan. When Ronald Reagan first went down to Central America and he was on Air Force One on the way home, journalists asked him what was the sort of what was his impression he said you know it's amazing they're, they're all individual countries down there <laughs> and so I, I i think that's that that contains some nugget of tr of of uh of, ac of accuracy in terms of we often think of this region with a broad brush uh we fail to distinguish between the different parts of the region different countries in the region different regions within those countries um so I'm going to ask our panelists today to do some broad brushing, but also some uh, fine brushwork as well. I would love to involve you guys. Uh, we have about 100 people on the call. 
more than, and the number's ticking up, 120 now. So I would love to include you guys in the conversation. And I'm not going to wait till the end to, to ask your questions. I'm going to try and monitor as our discussion is going on, uh, our Q&A uh, section. So please, please put your questions, comments in the Q&A for our uh, panel. We have about an hour and 10 minutes, so we could ha should have lots of opportunity for discussion. So back to the broad brush. Uh, the most recent big thing that's happened in um, Latin America was the election, re-election of Lula in Brazil, which means that now all the big economies are once again uh, in the hands of uh, left-leaning governments. But as always in Latin America, it's not united or coherent. Uh, move. It's not a movement at all, but it's not united and coherent shift. So um, maybe I'll turn first to you, Daniel. Can you, at a high level, give us a talk, talk us through the big regional trends here and give us a sense of how we can group countries together? And in particular, given the, the title of this panel, are some of these leaders more populist leaning and some less populist? Can you identify for us which is which? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the for the invitation um, today and, and, and for the presentation also. Uh, there's a lot of talking now about the pink tide in Latin America because uh, uh, almost every big economy, as you said, in Latin America right now is in the hands of left-wing governments. When say Lula in Brazil, uh, Andrés Manuel López Obrador in Mexico, Gustavo Petro in Colombia, Pedro Castillo in Peru, Alberto Fernández in Argentina, uh, Gabriel Boric in Chile, are different types of left. Uh, I will say that all of them are mostly democratic. Uh, some of them maybe with more authoritarian tendencies. I will say that uh, López Obrador has some authoritarian tendencies in Mexico. Uh, Castillo in Peru, Peronis in Argentina, that is uh, a, a type by, by itself. Uh, they are not radical. Um, that's why we are talking about more a pink tide and not a red tide. It's different than the red tide of the uh, 2000 with uh, Hugo Chavez uh, and, and after that Maduro in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia or Correa in Ecuador. They have a more revolutionary uh, style. But let me maybe tone down a little this idea of an ideological churn in Latin America that is going to the left. I will say that what's happened in most of recent elections in Latin America is more a rejection of the incumbents, more than a ideological uh, preference for, for the left. Um, the, the incumbents of the right are replaced by, by the left. Let's see, in, in Chile, for example, the opposition has won the last four presidential elections. There were uh, Bachelet in the left, was replaced by Piñera in the right. After that, Bachelet again in the left, Piñera again in the right, and now Boric in the left. So it's it's kind of a, of a rejection of the incumbents. In Argentina, Cristina was on the left, then was Macri on the right, now it's Alberto Fernandez on the left. Uh, in Brazil, after uh, the, the Workers' Party government with Lula and with Dilma Rousseff was Bolsonaro on the far right, then back again to Lula on the left. Uh, and, and you can go over and over. I think that in the uh, last 15 elections in Latin America, I think that in all the 15 elections, the opposition has won. So I will say that more than an ideological um, uh, ideological triumph of the of the left is that the democratic governments are not being capable of deliver or to satisfy the needs of citizens. So we have big protests, riots, violence in countries like Ecuador, Colombia, and Chile, and a rejection of the governments and maybe an openness of the citizens to give a chance maybe to more radical or out of mainstream candidates, uh, both in far right, you have the example of Bolsonaro, that was a surprise that someone so radical, so extreme as Bolsonaro won the election in Brazil four years ago, and now he lost, but for a very, very narrow difference uh, with Lula. Or in the left, you can see that in Colombia, for the first time in the history of Colombia, you have a left-wing government. So I think that the, the, the broad history right now is more a uh, decomposition of traditional parties, uh, a, 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 a discontent and, 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 and uh, a, a lack of satisfaction from the people of what democracy is offering them. And they are voting for other options, some of them more in the democratic tradition or some of them a little more to populist or authoritarian tendencies. Okay, but this has a, I mean, 
these elections have consequences in terms of relation. I mean, for example, Colombia and Venezuela, which have had quite tense relations at times, and now have much more warm relations, and it's it's it's, it's been a much better time uh, in that relationship. And presumably, you know, we uh, the the more authoritarian, should we put it, regimes, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, um, at times have more friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. family around them and times have more hostile family around them, right? So these these uh, elections do have a consequence for the region. Stephanie, what's your view? Do you share the same view? This is more about getting rid of the incumbents, which is, we should point out, is another very long running Latin American theme, kick out the government uh, and get a new, uh, get a whole load of new faces in who in four years time or whatever, will get rid of as well. Yeah, uh, here's what I think happened. Uh, after the 2013 protest we had in Brazil, there was a demand for radicalization because people were uh, unsatisfied with the how things were. And they needed a political figure that represented a rupture with that model that existed then. And since the left wing that was in the presidency at that moment didn't assume this role, the conservative party, the conservative uh, right, uh, occupy the space. And this new right then abandoned the more moderate liberal parties and assumed as a more aggressive, more authoritarian posture and uh, more populist too. Uh, Brazil did try to follow the same path as Chile when uh, Pinochet was in power, uh, which is of a hyper neoliberal uh, extreme right. But in the pandemic, uh, with the need to pay financial aid to low-income families, the government realized that this could be an asset for to win the elections. Um, so now, to win these elections, the left wing had to join uh, traditionally opposition parties in what they call the democratic front, that is also more moderate. So um, in my point of view, we had this transition uh, from a more traditional left wing to a very, uh, a very right wing, a very, yes, a very conservative right wing. And now uh, we are going into a more light left wing, maybe in, in Brazil, at least. I don't know in, in other places of Latin America, but surely in Brazil. Uh, and they represent also both kinds of populism. I was listening to a podcast uh, today about it. And uh, this uh, political scientist named Thomas de Barros, who is a professor at Sciences Po uh, University here in Paris, uh, he says that Lula and Bolsonaro are different kinds of populists. Uh, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro's populism uh, would be a more reactionary one, according to him. It's a type of populism that seeks to reinforce structure, structures of domination. Uh, so it's a populism for more conservative people. And uh, that can be seen in Bolsonaro's model in these elections uh, that was to divide people between the good versus the evil. While Lula, Lula's populism is more focused in the rise of the working class. Uh, in his words, he wants to put the poor on the government budget and the rich on the income tax. So I agree with what uh, Daniel said that uh, it's, a, uh, it's not exactly a traditional uh, left wing moment in Latin America. It's more like a People needing to change from uh, to from two conservative uh, uh, kinds of of governments. Okay, it sounds like we shouldn't. You you agree we shouldn't read too much into the uh, <laughs> what appears to be a shift to the left. Gabrielle, let me let me get your view as well. I mean, um, particularly you know, the, the, I think that the re one of the reasons that Lula has. Um, perhaps revive this meme is because um, Lula's the one thread that unites the last time we had a populist left-wing wave about 15, 10 years ago. Um, yeah. So this time Lula was is the one thing that unites those two. But what's different now in terms of 
uh, in terms of the politics, um, in terms of you know the constraints, the the, the context. Just in, and we can dig into this in more detail. But just in in general terms, what's different about the man here, and what's different about the context? Well, everything is different, um, and I would like to get um, from where Daniel and Stephanie um, brought to the table, which is, first of all, the incumbent in Brazil is a big defeat if you look at the uh, historical track record, because normally the president, the incumbent is the favorite to win re-elections in Brazil ever since the democratic period. So this was the first time ever the incumbent didn't win re-election in Brazil. So that poses a big defeat for Bolsonaro in the sense, in the historical background. But um, we have the pandemic um, in the middle and that has caused a big process of empowerment. And that also played a big role in when people went to the polls. So going back to your question, what's different that is we had a very tight elections and um, and Lula himself is different. I think the main question in Brazil, and that goes back to the differences within Latin America, is like, what is this Lula that is taking the office now? Is it the same Lula that took office the first time? Is it the same Lula that took office the second time? Is it the Lula that was in prison, reading his books in prison, or like being attacked by, by, by the, the accusations he had to face? So it, this is the million dollar question, and we still, where we have the results in our hand, but we still don't have that answer in place. What we do have, if you look at the other side on, from, from a different perspective in Bolsonaro's um, defeat, it's a big defeat for him, but it's a, like it showed that we have a divided country in the sense that we have people looking for economic uh, answers with the empowerment and seeing Lula as a good leader to, for that um, direction. But also you have that conservative wave that was very much clear in, in the results itself, but also in the, the, the way Congress is um, uh, structured now. And that, that the, the answer to, to that is that despite what we don't know about Lula, there's not much room for him to be that different to what he was in the past. So I think the answer starts on that and all the rest we're gonna be seeing for the next few days. And I don't think, going back to Latin America context, I think that I'm very intrigued to see how Lula, because I, I'm pretty sure that he want to form the alliance that he did in the past within the left lean leaders in Latin America, but I'm very curious to see how that's gonna play out with these nuances that you have from a country to the other. Just, just to start with the age gap is like we're talking about a 36, 37 year old in, in, in uh, Chile and with a 77 year old president with a lot of experience uh, in politics a very, very, very skillful uh, politician in Brazil. So I'm very intrigued to see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it, the, the big question there is about, I suppose, the, given Lula's standing, um, not only in, in the region, but in the world, um, in spite of, you know, I guess, views in Brazil are very, very mixed on Lula, obviously, which explains the, why the election was so tight. But he, do you think there's an expectation that he will um, be a leader to, you know, these, these younger, uh, be more of a regional leader, not just a um a uh, given the size of brazil given his experience given the inexperience of you know if you look at peru and chile both governments that have not been particularly competent so far uh given the inexperience and youth of their leaders is does he can he play more of a regional leadership role and a global leadership role uh, as brazil has always wanted to do I'll, I'll ask that to maybe to, to, to Stephanie first, because you have more of an international perspective being based in Europe. Yeah, um, Lula received actually a, a international support really quickly, minutes after the results of the elections. And uh, to me, what drew attention was the fact that this support came from all sides, uh, not only Latin America, but uh, on Twitter, Lula received uh, congratulations from President Biden, for example, but also from left-wing le leaders in Latin, in Latin America, and even from the Italian Prime Minister, uh, Giorgia Meloni, who is from the extreme right, like Bolsonaro. 
So it was interesting to see also that both Putin and Zelensky left message, messages of support for Lula, which can open up maybe interesting opportunities for Brazil in the diplomatic field. Um, Michel Bachelet said in an interview this year in August that the world and Latin America were missing Brazil. And I think that this was the general feeling behind the reception that President Lula received. Uh, like you said, Brazil was always an important or tried to be an important global player. Uh, but uh, the country was also very isolated in the past four years. And now I feel that the world is excited to being able to negotiate and make business with us again. Uh, a, new, a French newspaper said this week that the president uh, is expected that a, as a celebrity at COP27, um, as a, a representative of this new, according to the newspaper, of this new moment of hope for Brazil. He received more than 10 requests for bilateral meetings at COP, including meetings with China, the United States and Germany. Um, and I think he will uh, need to be very careful to keep all these friendships on such different fronts politically. I think the scenario for Brazil globally now is very positive, but it, all, it also comes uh, with very high expectations. Uh, so Lula will have a huge responsibility in his hands, especially when it comes to the Amazon, for example. Um, but yeah, I think it uh, comes it's more than just Latin America. Uh, of course, uh, I think every country in Latin America is very excited to have Brazil as a partner again. The president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandes, went to Brazil to personally greet Lula the day after the elections. But also President Biden called him uh, the day after too, as well as the French president Emmanuel Macron that even shared the video of the conversation on his Twitter. And in his video, he says uh, to Lula that the results of the elections were great news and that he was impatiently waiting <laughs> for this moment. Uh, of course, he had personal reasons uh, for that because Bolsonaro had publicly offended Macron's wife in 2019. But I think what is important in that conversation that is that he also expressed the wish that Brazil and, French and, and France can now, in his words, uh, launch a strategic partnership that matches our history and the challenges that awaits us. So uh, I think it's bigger than the, than just Latin America. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Danny, I was going to ask the same thing to you. I mean, part, part of what Stephanie touched on there is in Brazil, um, a bit like in, a, in the United States, uh, following the election of Joe Biden, is just kind of the ability to, to breathe again. And, and there's been this very uh, um, chaotic, unpredictable, um, uh, violent uh, uh, regime uh, in place in Brazil. And, and presumably some of the reaction is not, not so much in favor of Lula, but just a relief that, that Bolsonaro is no longer going to be uh, in power uh, after January. Um, is that uh, so that's sort of the, the what isn't there, but is there is there any there there? Is, do you think there's, there is real sense? I mean, you touched on the Amazon, Stephanie. I know you're an expert on that, so I want to ask you a bit more about that in detail in a minute. But that will be one totemic issue that I know that Lula wants to bring people together to, dis to discuss in the region. Um, do you think that on the Amazon or on other regional issues um, that, that he can really play uh, an important leadership role and bring countries together, Daniel? Yeah, well, Bolsonaro was also an example for like authoritarians, uh, wannabe uh, governments in, in in all South America. They have since they have uh, followers. So uh, a victory of Bolsonaro will have been seen as a victory of this kind of authoritarian tendencies also in all of South America. Uh, in 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 order to the leadership of Lula, I think that is undisputed. Uh, first of all, Brazil is. Uh, half of South, of South America, roughly uh, in terms of population, in terms of economy, is equal to the rest of South American countries uh, together. So it's very important. And Lula, of course, has the personal history to be seen as a leader. Uh, we have, a, 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 as we have uh, said uh, uh, before, we have very unexperienced presidents in Chile, Gabriel Boric, that is 
36 years old. Gustavo Petro is also a new president in Colombia. The government of Pedro Castillo in, in Peru is chaotic. You don't know how much he will stand in the, in the government. In Argentina, you have a president that is seen as he's not calling the shots in his own government because as the figure of Cristina Fernandez, who is the vice president, but is seen as something, is seen as more powerful even than, than Alberto. So there is no much competition for the leadership of uh, Lula. Uh, even so, I want to emphasize that this situation right now, when Lula is against in the government, is very different to the uh, red tide of the 2000s, where you have, a, first of all, you have Venezuela, that was a big power also in uh, uh, Latin America in this moment, Chavez was in the peak of his influence. He has the old money. Um, he has a banner of anti-imperialism, the Bolivarian Alliance, the Bank of the South, uh, many region-wide integration projects that are no longer available in, in, in South America. Uh, you have the boom in the commodity prices that was very important to this left-leaning uh, government, especially in Venezuela, especially in Ecuador. You don't have that anymore. Um, Venezuela's economy is totally destroyed. So the power that oil gave them is no longer there. And also Venezuela's international influence now is minimal. No left-wing leader want to be associated with Venezuela. It's a toxic trademark today in, in South American politics to be seen as friendly to the Maduro, to the Maduro government. Uh, so you have Lula as the only leader that, that can, can maybe uh, be a leader of the left but he don't have many of the tools that maybe were uh, possible in terms of integration, in terms of economics that were in, in, in the 2000s. So I think Lula is a pragmatic. Uh, he will work with uh, other South American leaders, but I'm not so sure on how decisive can, can be uh, to form this kind of uh, regional anti-USA uh, projects that were so relevant maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Okay, wonderful. And I'm going to encourage our audience once again, we have really good attendance today. Uh, please send us your questions. And so to show you that I'm serious about, about this, I'm going to ask you a question here, uh, which is exactly about the issue you just uh, raised, Daniel. And Gabriel, I'll put this to you first. And it's from Gonzalo Bayadares. Apologies if I got your name wrong. Um, how do you believe the pink tide uh, will affect, if we're going to accept that it is that, will affect relations between the region overall and the US and China. So you touched on the US there, uh, Daniel. Do you think left-leaning governments are not as interested in strengthening relations with the US? What is the, the attitude towards the US now? How would you characterize it um, among Latin American governments? Do they care? Um, does it, obviously in the US, we, we tend to fret about you know, our role and vis-a-vis -vis China or at various times Iran in the region. Uh, the, the, from the, what's the view from the region? Do people care? Is this important relationship? Uh, Bolsonaro and Trump were obviously uh, close, but, you know, is this, is it necessary to have good relations with the US? What does it uh, gain you? Gabriel, let me start with you. Yeah, well, um, the Workers' Party has always been seen as a, an anti-America, as Daniel put it. And you, the more they get closer to the alliances and to towards the left, the more they like want more distance from America. But Lula has been in the office for quite a long time, and I don't think that for the moment um, there is nothing that is going to surprise us on that side. What I'm interested to see is on the other side is like how much of the alliances in the past with China played a big role in during uh, the Workers' Party and especially Lula because he was very good in bringing uh, projects within that um, group of uh, countries. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be um, that strong of alliance at the moment and Lula has seen it seems to be a bit disconnected from this new reality, this new world that, uh, um, that we see out there. And I think that going back to what Daniel said is like, if you look all the, um, Lula is obviously the, 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 the candidate to, to bring the alliance within Latin America. Um, but um, the question is whether the agenda, uh, what is the agenda that, will, that who put forward as being the leader in uh, with, in the region. He, in the past, he had a very clear agenda, 
uh, and he was very uh, um, able to to navigate that agenda, being with very clear um, demands worldwide. At the moment, it's some of the things that happen is that can show very clearly how the world is seeing Lula as a leader. You know, you touched in the Amazon, for instance, you have the funding, like countries that stop funding uh, policies in uh, um, the Amazon conservation have already, just for the simple fact that Lula got elected, already released some of the funding that was halted in the past. But it's just like, you know, when you talk, for instance, of, uh, with the US, it's like, uh, what is the energy transition like um, uh, that is being planned, is being for, put forward by this new elected government? We, we, we don't see it very clearly. And that's what it's going to have to bring to the table whenever he goes and talk to a, like a, a stronger alliance with America, for instance. So um, um, this is, I think it's a big doubt when we look for foreign relations, you know, like Luca is a very, Lula is a very charismatic. He has the, uh, he will have open doors in, throughout the world. It's just like, what is, what does he want to do with that? You know, like what is his bringing to the negotiations? And that includes America as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go to another question actually just came in from Manuel Sanchez. Uh, Daniel, maybe I'll put this to you because it's about the other big economy we haven't talked about, which is Mexico, of course. Um, and what's your opinion of AMLO's role in Latin American democracy being such a conservative and authoritarian leftist, says Manuel? What's your view on AMLO and what, uh, what the outlook is for Mexico? Yeah, well, he's kind of a phenomenon because he has very high level of popularity, which is very, very, very uh, uncommon in uh, Latin American uh, governments. He has, uh, I think, four years in the government has been very popular in all the, you know, the government. He combined different tendencies because he tend to be very authoritarian, the kind of a charismatic, personalistic uh, 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 kind of leadership uh, that, is, uh, that is working well with the, with the population. Uh, he presents himself as the champion of the people against the corrupt elites. So he has this kind of uh, very populist uh, approach, but he's working uh, inside the institutions. So he's working as a democratic as a democratic president, but with a speech that is very populist, that, that is very uh, a, a, a speech of confrontation between the people that is represented by him and the corruption of the traditional uh, elites in Mexico. So he's kind of having this uh, this difficult equilibrium uh, in. In terms of his leadership in Latin America, I will say that in historical terms, Mexico ha has not been so strong as you could think, because it's a very, very, uh, of course, a big country, but it's not had been very strong in terms of having this kind of leadership to South America. Uh, this is more a role of, of Brazil in historical terms, or even Argentina, when, when Argentina was was stronger in, in his economy and, and his, and his the diplomatic ties. So I don't think that AMLO has uh, so much ambitions to uh, work on an international leadership as Lula obviously has. Uh, but I think that it's a very interesting model of how uh, left-wing populist speech can work in a country like Mexico and be popular. And, 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 and give us some stability to, to, a, to a country that has so many problems in kind of this uh, country that's very difficult to govern, that has many uh, local powers, that of course has a problem of, of violence. Uh, but uh, AMLO has been successful in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, kind of internal work, but I don't think that he so, has so many possibilities to, to work in an international leadership as uh, Lula will, will, will be. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, you, you raised the point that maybe we should have talked about earlier that populism in general in European or uh, Anglo-Saxon context is thought of as a bad thing. Whereas in, I think it's fair to say in Latin America, populism is not necessarily thought of as a bad thing, but it can be a very positive thing. Um, and, uh, and that's a sort of a linguistic and, and the cultural difference that it's worth pointing oh, out if you didn't already just, know that. Yeah, 
Yeah, maybe it's it's it's, it's very difficult to to define populism because it's a it's a it's a word that is used with many many different uh, uh, meaning. Um, I will say that the, maybe the 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 Cas Mood is one of the of the important thinker in populism, and he said two things that I think can be said to identify populism. The first of them is the division of society into antagonistic group, the pure people versus the corrupt elite. And, and populists, of course, claim that they are representing the people. And the second one is that populism does, does not trust the institution and try to skip this intermediation, political parties, Congress, technocratic institution, experts, uh, and replace them with uh, the direct connection between the people and a charismatic leader. I think if, if someone has these two uh, characteristic, like the division between people and, and, and elites, and uh, the kind of direct connection with a charismatic leader keeping the institution, I think these are two ways that are useful to detect uh, populism. Okay, thank you for that. And that brings me back to Brazil because, you know, Lula perhaps was more populist last time. This time, maybe he has to, he's more constrained by institutions. Um, and Stephanie, you know, we talked a little bit about the changes that have happened um, in the context since the last time he was in power. Some of those big ones are the, the growth of evangelical Christianity, which is a huge boost to Bolsonaro, um, and the shift in the economy more uh, away from the coast and towards um, agribusiness. The, both those things have probably added to the country generally being more polarized, which is the situation now that Luda has to, in which Luda has to govern. How does that change things and how much wiggle room will he have? Yeah, you talked about him being uh, constrained by institutions, but also by new alliances he had to make. So his vice president, for example, is a member of a party that was historically an opposition to the workers' party, that is Lula's party. Um, so, uh, but as Gabriel was saying, Lula is a very experienced politician, and he's famous for uh, his ability of... Uh, making concessions, of uh, making new alliances, of uh, bringing different people together. And that's how he won this election. So, um, but I think, yeah, that's the great question everybody is waiting to, to discover. I mean, uh, how is he, what is he going to do to, to unite the country. Once again, he said in his speech uh, when he won the elections uh, that he was going to govern for all people, that he's going to govern for all the country and not only for people that voted for him. Uh, I think that's a great first step, but um, how is he going to do that? I think it's going to be a, a mystery. But on the other hand, uh, although we have a Congress that, uh, was elected uh, that is more conservative and was elected elected supporting uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, I think a lot of those people now are starting to to uh, to show some kind of support to Lula. They're not going to make a huge opposition uh, uh, of his government. I, I think, um, and they're also. Uh, of course, we have the the people who are 100% with Bolsonaro and not, are not going to change their position, but I think it's going to be less, uh, an, op an opposition is going to be less strong than people maybe might imagine. I don't know if Gabriel agrees with me, you're in Brazil, what do you think of, what's the feeling there? <laughs> I think um, constraint is a very good word to use for his new term because, as you say, is you, you mentioned two of the forces that like show how different the country is that he's going to uh, be governing, which is the evangelical um, um, group and, uh, and uh, the rural areas, the agribusiness um, leaders being very close to Bolsonaro. Um, it's because also they, this is the new conservative um, side of Brazil that was very much clear during Bolsonaro and such as Trumpism, we now face this sort of uh, Bolsonarism that is here to stay. And that is going to be the thing that he will have to handle throughout his new term. He, he had to do this throughout his campaign. You know, he was talking about himself like being in favor of 
abortion. And then he had to reverse what he had said because that was like kind of got him hurt. And throughout um, the campaign, he was also shown that, as I said, you know, we are trying to figure out what what is this Lula that is going to that is going to take place. And uh, um, we we thought that after being in prison for that whole period, he'd be more extreme to what his roots were, in in the sense that the left agenda, a lot of state intervention in the economy, and um, and not very worried with the fiscal long-term stability and all that stuff. But throughout, from this, the first round to the runoff, he had to bring some of the coalition, like enlarge this coalition and bring not only um, the, on the moral side, the conservatives, but also like more center and moderate people to do, do, do his um, coalition that is going to take place. So that would be a challenge for him. So that is going to be a, a very big constraint to do whatever he wants to do. It might be that there is not gonna be that room for, he, for him to be doing. And something else that I wanna to turn to the economy because obviously we're here at Booth um, and the economy is also gonna be difficult including international markets. I note that uh, last week when Lula started talking about his priority being social spending, um, <laughs> the bond markets reacted quite negatively and it was I think your central bank uh, chief said it was his Liz Trust moment, of course, referring to the uh, British prime minister who left office after such a short period of time after saying she was going to have unfunded uh, spending, which is something we're very familiar with in Latin America. But I want to turn to a question from our audience, um, which I think is, is, a, is a great uh, point here, particularly from the University of Chicago, given that we, uh, I think it's fair to say that the University of Chicago inspired um, some of the free market reforms that took place in Latin America over the years, some have which have been more successful, some of which have been less successful. So um, the question is from Mauro Cunha. Again, apologies if I mispronounced your name. Since we are at Booth, I'm concerned with the future of economic liberalism. It has always been associated with the right, even if many times the right developed a taste for dirigism. You said you mentioned that yourself, Gabriel. Did Bolsonaro kill the chances of liberalism in Brazil and Latin America? Do you think we gonna, still have? Yeah, Gabriel, do you want to handle that one first? Do we still is that are we going to have more free market reforms, or they sort of has the well been poisoned? Do you think? Um, I wouldn't say he killed, but he really hurt really bad <laughs> um, because. Um, well, it was an experiment and he had the chance to experiment that, you know, like Paulo Guedes himself having gone to Chicago and all like um, having worked with the Chilean government in the past. Um, but um, it, you were mentioning the Listras moment and that comparison is being done very um, often now because he, it was that day that he more openly was showing the side of, of his like will in the sense, you know, like um, now he is an elected leader, so whatever he says, it does has an influence in markets. And uh, and we today we're seeing a, a very good example of what, what I'm trying to say because we had there was a rebound in markets. It was not because Lula came and said, you know, look, that's not what uh, what I was saying, but also but mainly because the the house speaker came out and said look you know he's talking about this waiver because at the moment they're like negotiating a waiver for the fiscal targets for 2023 and uh, the speaker of the house said you know it's not going to be like this that you can come out and say look we need this waiver because you know social spending is very important and it's a separate thing to fiscal stability so he came out and said, no, that's not how we play here. It, if you're going to sit down with us, we can actually talk about waiver, but you won't have the chance to make that waiver last for the, for the next four years. You know, So that is a big constraint that you have to face. And I think that when it comes to free markets and how much the state will have an intervention in the economy, I think Congress will play a big role on that. And... Um, and it's fair to say that during Bolsonaro, we didn't see liberalism at its um, uh, best form in the sense that Bolsonaro himself didn't believe in that. And that was something that we saw very clear to start with in his uh, government. 
And some of the, the things that they are talking about negotiating the budget for the next year, um, it's, it's due to how much Bolsonaro tried to give out just in order to get his reelection. And it, it goes against all the manuals of free markets and in, in, in the good um, um, taking care of, of uh, the fiscal side. So it, it's, it's, it's not that easy to, to just um, um, uh, associate Bolsonaro with free markets and Lula with intervention because Lula has a very practical side and he showed that in his first term that he can, if he needs to deliver austerity, who we'll do so in order to try to go around and get out some of the policies that he thinks are good for on the social side. And then the constraints, Gabriel, that you mentioned there are not just constraints uh, of, of the fact that they're there, um, there isn't enough money, and they don't just apply to. Oh, sorry, the constraints of an institution uh, constraining presidential power, or the constraints of one country, but they apply more generally, right, Daniel? I mean, in many countries, um, there isn't, there just isn't enough money to pay for the social spending that leaders uh, want to make. And in many sense, you could say this is a terrible time to be elected. You know, high inflation, global economy looks set to plunge into the. Uh, well, we're, in, we're already in the early stages of recession, most likely. Um, yeah, I guess two questions there. One is, you know, is there much that leaders can do in terms of social spending that they, that they want to do because there just isn't the cash around? And second, how well placed generally is uh, the region to weather the coming storm? Not that I'm asking you to predict exactly what it will look like. Yeah, I think that a good news in this kind of pink tide, if we want to use the, use the term, is that you are seeing more responsible leaders. I mean, if you compare what, uh, of course, Venezuela did in, in the moment with all the, all the money of the oil, they just spent everything. And uh, well, the results, we know what they are. You have, you have now two presidents in Colombia and in Chile that are new in the government, and both of them are advancing the ideas of tax reforms in order to increase social spending, but in a responsible way, to have like uh, the incomes from taxes, they can do it. And I think in, in both cases, there are reforms that are, you can say that are very moderate, very rational. In the case of Colombia, you have Jose Antonio Campos, the Minister of Economy, that is a very prestigious uh, academic, uh, someone that is moderate. And the tax reform of Petro is moving forward in the Congress in Colombia, has been very successful. Uh, it will create a wealth tax, which is, of course, controversial, but you must uh, consider that uh, Latin America is one of the more unequal uh, parts of the world, and especially Colombia and Chile are two of the more unequal uh, countries in, in Latin America. They will tax the mining sector, the energy sector. It will increase taxes on unhealth uh, products. So I think that the tax reform in Colombia is a is a good way to say how you can uh, have a left government that, of course, will promise more social spending, but you can have it in a, in a very responsible way. And in the case of Chile, also, you have Gabriel Boric, which is uh, the leader of the, of the broad front, that is a left-wing coalition, but now it's in a coalition of government with more moderate elements of the, uh, of the concertación, that was the, uh, the coalition that governed Chile for many decades. And essentially, the program of Boric now is social democrat. They are trying to put forward two reforms, uh, one to the tax system in order, again, to tax more heavily biggest fortune and the extraction of minerals, and a pension system reform that move from a private run individual account system to a more mixed system with, with, with many elements of individual accounts, but also with more elements of solidarity. So you see that these two new leaders in two countries in Latin America are trying to uh, put a responsible way to, to, to manage the social pressure that are mounting in society. And I think that is a, is a good sign of what can happen in the next years in, this, uh, in these countries. Okay. Um, I want to turn to the Amazon because, Stephanie, we said we would talk about this. And this is a huge issue that was part of Lula's campaign and no doubt is why he's been greeted as a rock star um, in Egypt and, and in other places as well. Um, he has touted his credentials the last time around and his ability to uh, cut this deforestation. I believe this time around he's promised zero deforestation over the next four years. 
massive increases in regulation. Do you think he's going to be able to get a regional agreement, a, a global uh, buy-in, and do you think he's going to be able to get it done? Yeah, um, so I, I think it's interesting that uh, this actually became an important uh, issue for him now because it wasn't in his past governments. Uh, and I think that I, I good, a good uh, indication of that is that he was willing to make an alliance and to uh, bring together to his side Marina Silva, that was is a historically uh, known person in Brazil uh, for defending the Amazon's interests and sustainability and all these kind of things. Uh, but I think uh, to know if he's going to be able to... Uh, bring everybody together to this new uh, plan. I think it's not just up to him, you know, you know, you need the company's interest in that, you need the other country's interest in that. Um, I've, I know he's an experienced politician and that uh, he'll be able to, to talk to people about it and to maybe convince people about it. But uh, I don't know if everybody's interests are uh actually focus on that question uh i think maybe we still have some years ahead to to see how it goes especially given presumably uh gabriel put this one to you that some of those who will have to be mo who will be most affected by a deforestation policy are the ones who like lula the, the least and were the most strongest uh supporters of bolsonaro not only politically, ideologically, but benefited financially um, from his regime. Do you think it's going to be possible to um, kind of enact a transformation within Brazilian society to get those people uh, on board? Or how will he deal with them? Oh, that, uh, again, I think it's, it seems common sense to be talking about his experience, but I think it, it, it does play a difference here in, in the sense that um, you try to form like a, a coalition to, of people interested in that subject, including the people that are not very keen to talking about it. So I think one difference to start with is that he takes it very seriously and he is aware that this is a worldwide problem and that Brazil can benefit a lot from it. And that is a massive shift. And if you get like people like Marina Silva, which is a, an, an activist, environmental activist, was born in the forest, knows everything about it, and has come up with plans in the past, has been studying this for quite a long while, I think he has better chances of finding the right policies on that side. It's not going to be easy to talk to some of the Bolsonaro's alliance, uh, Moses allies in that issue because you have to bring agribusiness to the table and sometimes like it's they're gonna have it's not that easy to let go of land and and how much um that will benefit them but i think it's very very clear and obvious that this is one of the main issues that we we'll have to deal with and he he started talking about this very early in his campaign brought Marina to the table. And I think that made a difference already by the, the simple fact that he became this superstar in Egypt. And he's a person that, in that can have, um, can at least sit to negotiate in good terms. Yeah, what I think it was uh, very interesting uh, that Marina said in uh, an interview, was that he, she only agreed to participate in, Gula, in Lula's government and campaign this year because uh, she made him promise that he would bring sustainability and the environmental issues to all of the all of his government, not only this ministry, you know, because uh, countries can, can do that sometimes. They just create this ministry of sustainability and it's just an isolated thing and what she wants to do with him in this new new ad administration is to really make sustainability a thing that uh, goes through all, all of the areas, the economics, the education, the health, uh, everything. So it becomes really uh, a guide to his government. 
Excellent. Okay, Daniel, I want to turn to you because we actually have a question that mentions Chile. So let's take advantage of that um, from Alfredo Achondo. Um, how do you see liberal, in quotes, Latin American left, e.g. Chile, relating to authoritarian Latin American left? Uh, he's given us an example here, Peronism, uh, Venezuela, particularly how would the new left approach human rights and corruption issues. You talked about how you know, nobody wants to be seen to be friends with Caracas. Um, and, and when you gave your list of uh, things that characterize populism, one of the things you didn't mention, but that always struck me when I was in Latin America was um, constitution. That the, the, the populists always want to rewrite the constitution. So that, will, that will be the answer to everything. What we need is an assembly and we spend years campaigning and then, you know, new constitution arrives and it makes no difference at all. And or, or often doesn't make much of a difference. And of course, in Chile, we had the example of uh, a failed attempt to, uh, to to get a new constitution. It, it, does that kind of symbolize some of the connection there between uh, this new young uh, Taylor Swift loving left and the uh, and the kind of old or more radical left? And what yeah. will and, we'll, and and to Alfredo's question, what will what will relations be if they won't be? Nobody want if Venezuela is toxic. How will they deal with Venezuela? Yeah, it's difficult because Venezuela is toxic. And uh, for example, in the in the in the presidential campaigns in Chile in the in the last years, they the the politician for the right has always talked about Chilezuela, saying that if the if the left win, Chile will go to to this uh, to this path. I think that uh, one of the reasons because President Boric was elected was precisely because he was very very clear in saying that Venezuela is a dictatorship. Venezuela is violating human rights. And that is no example, no model for a government in Chile. Uh, he won a primary uh, between Boric and the Communist Party candidate, Daniel Halwe, who was much, uh, he was not so clear in, different, in, in the differentiation from Venezuela. Boric did it, was seen as more moderate, and that was very important for him to get to the, to the presidency. So I think that uh, there is no relation, and uh, President Boric has been very uh, vocal in. Uh, saying that Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, and dictatorship where the human rights are violated. Uh, in, in terms of the, of the constitution, I think there are very different models on how and why try to rewrite a constitution. What Chavez did, and was the model that also Evo Morales also followed in Bolivia and uh, Correa in Ecuador, was to be in the government and use the constitutional process to concentrate power in his hands. So it was a process that was uh, from the above, from the government in order to concentrate power. What happened in Chile was, was very different because the government that uh, agrees to the, to the new constitution was a right-wing government. It was forced because of the pressure of the, the, pressure of the people to, 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 to be able to have this uh, constitutional convention. Um, so it was not a... Uh, uh, an idea of concentrated power, but to make some kind of solution to a social and political crisis that was very, uh, very difficult in Chile. And well, the, this idea of the people writing a new constitution, uh, I think was an interesting uh, idea. Um, uh, the, 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 the mood of the citizen in Chile when they vote for the constitutional convention in charge of writing a new constitution was the rejection of the elite, the rejection of traditional political parties. So they vote mainly for independence, local leaders of environmental, indigenous, uh, pro-woman movements. Um, and this group was unable to make a work that, was, uh, that made sense to the, to the citizens. Uh, so the idea fails quite dramatically. The, the constitutional draft failed in the referendum two months ago. 62% of the people voted against it. And I think that marks how, how difficult it is to represent the people because <laughs> uh, all, all the idea of this convention was, oh, at least you have normal people, independent, none of the elites writing a new constitution. So say, okay, it's a populist moment in which the people will be able to write it. Uh, but then the people, all the people in the, the citizens of Chile said in a very, very large majority that that work doesn't represent them. Uh, many view the draft as too extreme, especially in the rights that we're giving to the indigenous people. 
And also, I think that a factor relevant in the in the fail of the of the constitution in the referendum was that the government of President Gabriel Boric was so deeply compromised with the convention, was seen as the government of Boric and the convention was seen for many people as the same thing. So it was an opportunity for the population to deliver a non-trust vote against the government because of the problems of crime, inflation, etc. So there were many things that doesn't work appropriately, but I think that uh, as, an, as a failed experiment, it was very different of what Chavez and Venezuela did with the constitution that was concentrate power and try to, to, to undermine democracy. Excellent. Okay, thank you for that distinction. Um, I'm going to note that it's one o'clock, but we are, just as a reminder, going to carry on for another 15 minutes. If you're able to stay with us, please do. Please keep sending your questions in. I'm going to put uh, another one that's that's uh, kind of such an interesting fundamental question from Sarush. Uh, I'm not going to attempt your last name, but it begins with a T. Um, what is currently missing from the political environment in Latin America that could possibly encourage more cooperation among these countries, similar to what we see in the EU? big kind of basic question in Latin American politics 101. These countries share so much linguistically, culturally. Why do they find it so hard to act um, together? And maybe, Gabriel, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that, because that obviously relates to Lula's attempt, if he has one, to be, uh, be more of a regional representative. Um, I'd say that's a very good question, because the language is similar. The, the ideology is similar, but then what are the results they can get? I can, I can, I have a good experience in uh, working with the auto industry, and um, it's a funny thing. And I'll just do this remarks, just an anecdotal thing, just an example. Uh, Brazil and Argentina were able to share a, like an integration in terms of the the way the cars are assembly between the two markets. And the reason I'm like using that as an example, so you have trucks being built by Ford in Argentina and cars, like smaller cars being built in Brazil and in a, in a free trade agreement between the two of them. So in order that Brazil can like uh, manufacture cars for the Brazilian market, which is bigger, so, it's, so that therefore the smaller cars and then sending the smaller cars to Argentina while we get the trucks from Argentina, which are in smaller volumes. That worked very okay. And the, the reason why I'm using that example is because there was a very shy attempt of trying to build a common currency. And one of the examples was like how much the auto industry trade among uh, between Argentina and Brazil. But um, I think um, the problems each country faces on its own reality, I think is a very big obstacle because whenever there were talks in that direction, Argentina was um, having to negotiate a package with IMF in order to provide funding for like basic stuff. And there were taxes that were being put in place for exports. So all the talks were being blurred by the urgencies of each, other, each country's own reality. And I think that's a very difficult, a very difficult thing to say um, when um, you see the region as a block and you know, like you kind of have looking from the outside world and, and obviously not as much interest as um, bigger um, central um, regions such as the US and Europe, is that these nuances within Latin America are very hard to, to, um, to to overcome in, in order to form like a, a proper block. So you have a, 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 the Mercosur, which is the, 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 the commercial block, but he, the, the conversation didn't go very, very um, beyond that, you know? And I think uh, part of it is also always dealing with its own problems within the country. And, and you have like, there are many attempts and you have like, Someone like Lula could, could, could be the one to be doing this, but it hasn't been done so far. And I don't think this will be the time that will be done, you know. Okay, Daniel, do you have any thoughts on that, on regional cooperation? Yeah, just to add what, what Gabriel said, uh, we also have like these ideas of uh, political and economic integration, but they are too dependent of the 
personal and ideological ties between the presidents of the different countries. We have this idea of UNASUR that was in the uh, left side uh, um, of, uh, of the 2000s. But when the governments changed, when in Chile came Piñera, replacing Bachelet, in Colombia was Duque, in Peru was Kuczynski, in Brazil, Bolsonaro, they said, okay, UNASUR no more, and then we will start another organization that is ProSUR. And that was like two or three years when the president in the right that they were forming it, were, were supporting it. Uh, but now you can't hear uh, against uh, about ProSUR any, anymore because the president are not there and because we have left-wing governments and they don't want to have nothing to do with ProSUR because they think that it's a right-wing thing. So you don't have like uh, a more coherent uh, international uh, politics in which you can say, okay, from here 10 to 20 years, these are our goals and we will work together because it changed too much and every every ideological uh, churn uh, want to have his own trademark and his own organizations and maybe this will happen again we will have again now another organization with another name uh, or maybe the the rebirth of unasur and now that the the left is against in power but maybe in three or four years more they will be be, be, be gone again okay excellent i, I want to uh, move on to another question from our audience um, this is from Nicolas Martinez Sanchez, and Nicolas um, is asking specifically, kind of, is, is asking you a question about where the commodity markets are going, which I know you guys are too smart to answer, but his question, and then I'm going to kind of build on his question. What are your thoughts how the pink tide, uh, we'll, we'll put that in inverted commas, will affect mineral commodity supply prices at a time when global markets are in flux? Many of these countries, Brazil, Chile, Peru, top uh, global producers, of course, we could include in that um, uh, other other commodity. I mean, the, all the big economies are kind of commodity uh, producers, just to a certain extent. And um, I guess my question that I would build on Nicholas's question, without asking you to predict the mark where the markets are going, is um, how dependent are big, the big economies still on extractive uh, industries, which in the past, um, you know, that's kind of been the lifeblood of the economy and the, the fate of the economy is invariably dependent on the ups and downs of the commodity market. And when things are good, um, nobody really says very much about it. And when things turn bad, then everybody says, oh, we need to diversify the economy. And that's a cycle that's been going on for decades in, uh, well, particularly in, in, in South America. Stephanie, what are your thoughts on that? How dependent do you think uh, the big uh, economies are on, on extractive uh, uh, exports. Yes, that's actually one of the challenges we face when we think of uh, sustainability, because Brazil is very dependent on uh, the oil industry and uh, mineration. So uh, when if we think of the energy transition, it's very hard to see how Brazil would uh, effectively do that, because uh, we depend uh, a lot on, this, on these industries. Uh, when we had the the crisis the of the of the oil crisis in 2014 maybe 15 uh some cities in brazil just crashed because they were totally dependent on the oil industry not only di directly but indirectly too we had some cities in rio for example that were uh built uh almost uh totally uh because of this industry so we had uh, the commerce, the commerce suffering. We had uh, hospitals and schools closing because we were not, not no longer working in this his, in these industries. Uh, so yeah, it's a challenge we face, and I think I think we're very far from um, from becoming a, a a different kind of of economy that is not uh, totally dependent on uh, extractivism. Um, and we we do have some some industrialization, but uh, Gabriel will probably have more data on this. But we are still very very connected to our uh, strativism industry. Gabriel, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I think uh, the answer very much clear is yeah, very dependent. We have. Um, a mining and oil industry being the biggest uh, sources of external income. 
And, um, but going back to the environmental agenda, which I think it has a link here, we have the opportunity for once to start thinking of a new, a new source of income and a new um, divert, more diversified um, economy looking into the energy transition era. And I think we're kind of a bit behind on that and being with the Amazon and the role it's going to play, I think that we need to put more effort on it. And that's what I think it's going to be one of the challenges looking ahead. Okay, thank you. And Daniel, obviously you're sitting in one of the world's biggest uh, copper producers. Um, and just on your side of the, of the continent, there's obviously the big silver and gold and lead and everything else. Uh, that comes out of the Andes. Um, is there has there been any move at all to make um, to make the, the continent, in your view, less dependent on extractive industries? Well, in the in the speech, in the words, yes, but in the in the facts, no. Uh, I mean, sixty years ago, the half of the exports of Chile were copper. Twenty years ago, half of the exports of Chile were copper. Today, half of the exports of Chile are copper. That's and not, not changing, and raw copper, no, no more sophisticated uh, than that. Uh, because I think that the economic incentives is living on the rents. Um, in, 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 in many Latin American countries, there have been many, many discussion about how to uh, improve the investment on research and development, but mm, that does not change uh, at all. And I, I uh, agree with, uh, with Gabriel that we have a big opportunity right now if we are able to, to use it, that is the, the, the energy transition. Uh, in the case of many South American countries, for example, we have big opportunities uh, in lithium. Uh, we have the triangle of lithium in, in Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia, but we are getting like behind uh, because Australia is, is, is more and more, is producing more and more, and Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia are not being capable to, to, to do it in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, we have the green hydrogen, that is also a big opportunity. And we have uh, in countries like Chile, also in uh, Peru, solar energy. But we are countries that are very, very, our natural environment, the desert is uh, very good for solar energy. And in this particular point, I think Chile has done some things well. We are moving for a, a more clean energy with solar energy, with wind energy. So we can do it. If we put the correct incentives, we can do it. But I think that the government has been very quick, very weak. Uh, also very captured by special interests that live of the rents of the mining of the fishing uh, and they don't want to 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 change nothing because it's very very comfortable to to, to living on the rents okay thank you for introducing that very stiglarian point about uh, <laughs> living off of rents and special interests okay so i want to turn to one final audience question to close it out here with maybe give you an opportunity to leave us on a positive note from luis uh, or louis uh, Sanabria, uh, I agree. All eyes will be on Lula. Lula can be could be the catalyst to promoting an EU economic bloc within Latin America. Where you've kind of poo pooed that, but uh, his he carries on. It has the resources to construct a vigorous import export dynamic. With Lula on the world stage, Brazil, Brazil can wield effective soft power policy. This next decade could be an exciting period in Latin America. How many times have we heard? Uh, that before. But uh, the old joke about, you remember the development joke about Brazil as a country with a great future ahead of it, and always will be. But um, <laughs> I mean, more seriously, you know, uh, you talked about economic moderation, that they won't, you don't expect a lot of, you know, radical social spending, we, when they're not really populist, to go to the title of this uh, talk, um, maybe we'll have a chance to tackle big regional issues like deforestation. Uh, perhaps this is a, this is going to be a good uh, you know period uh, years ahead uh, for the region. Just one quick closing out thought that might you might give us some words of optimism. Stephanie, let me start with you. Okay, yeah, it was funny because Brazil is always the country of the future, but it's time to be the country of the present. We are hoping for it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm auto optimistic because uh, we were all worried. Uh, that Lula might have become more more radical because of his timing in jail, and uh, he'll have all sorts of um, uh, contents, um, all all sorts of, <laughs> all sources of 
uh, of things to 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 avoid becoming a very radical left wing uh, politician. And I think the more centered we are in this moment, the best, the better. So, um, yeah, I'm 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 optimistic that we're having a democratic uh, government because we we faced a government that was very authoritarian. And uh, this instability is all is also bad for the economy, uh, and is also bad for uh, our re relationship with other countries. So now we're facing a period of more hope and more um, trust in the institutions and in uh, Brazilian democracy. I think that this will be important for us, and at the same time, we'll have um, instruments to limit his power and to limit. Uh, what he's going to do. So I'm, I think it's going to be a good moment. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Gabriel, are you optimistic? <laughs> OK, I have uh, one source of optimism. It might be that oh, despite the challenging year that we face ahead, and I, the reason I point out to the first year, because it's a very important um, um, direction that is going to be shown in the, his first year of term, is that we started our homework to say um, by of um, raising interest rates um, be ahead of everyone else in the world, so that gives us a chance, you know, to um, to leave this economic uh, challenging um, environment a bit earlier. And if if Lula does everything that he, if he, if there is not a, a big surprise amidst in between that time, then we can start a bit better than the rest of the world. You know, while we talk about recession worldwide and Brazil is going to be like cutting interest rates and will have the chance, you know, to let its economy breathe again. Obviously, with not very good headwinds coming from abroad, but still, I think that was, that is the one thing I could say in terms of optimism. I'm very skeptical about the reforms and about like a, 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 a big chance of modernization of the economy throughout that term. You know, I'm, I'm not very op optimistic on that side. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Give us an optimistic regional uh, picture. I can give an optimistic view in the in the politics side because despite all that has happened, despite despite all the challenges. Uh, democracy is fighting back. Democracy is still resisting. You can see that in Brazil, a wannabe dictator like Bolsonaro was kicked out, and now we have a reasonable politician like, like Lula. Um, you have that in Peru, even if the governments are a disaster and they are going to be replaced one or two years, but they're still having democratic institutions, they're still held, holding elections. Uh, Colombia and, on, and Chile had uh, very difficult problems, riots, violence, and they we work it in the democratic way and we elected uh, presidents that are maybe out of the of the, uh, the, the the traditional elites but they are working in the in the traditional institution so i think that uh, maybe it is a risk of contagious from venezuela for example from the dictatorship of venezuela that was seen as a model in some moment has disappeared and also the risk of contagious of bolsonaro that also offers us authoritarian alternative has also been less attractive now. So I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a good news that despite all the problems, we still have democracies functioning, we still have institutions, and we still have elections. Excellent. That's not something to be taken for granted, either in Latin America or indeed in, um, in uh, North America. So uh, I thank you very much for those of us who stayed with us to the bitter end. Um, and thank you particularly to our panel, Stephanie, Gabrielle, and Daniel. This has been a great discussion. We could have talked for a lot longer. Thank you for your terrific questions. And um, I guess I should say stay tuned for more events from the Stiegler Center, uh, hopefully more on Latin America. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>